publishing and agenting specifically for 15 years. I started out on the publishing side at Faber um, in a very specific role that was looking after the poetry estates and the poets and authors who didn't have agents, but whose interests I would look after in kind of, you know, um, film and theatre and things like that. So that was a really good uh, grounding for learning about the kind of what I see as the two pillars of agenting, which is uh, one, which is author, author care. So day-to-day -day care of your author. The author is kind of centre to everything that we do. Um, and the second part is, um, you know, as opposed to maybe the work, the author to me is the primary focus over what they're writing. Um, and the second part was was kind of deal making and and, and that side of it and, and want to, you know, you have to enjoy and um, take something out of the thrill of the deal making, I think as well. So those two aspects um, really kind of led me to a career in wanting to be an agent rather than on the publishing side. Um, and that led me to um, go start an agency uh, where I was a contracts director and a slightly unglamorous side of the business, but gave me, again, a really good foundation for future negotiation. And then from there, I kind of almost went back to the beginning and became an assistant at an agency um, and kind of learned, learned the trade from the bottom upwards and, and used that time to start building my list. And the thing with an agent is it's a really hard thing to kind of quantify whether an agent's good or not. You can only really go by their authors and um, what their authors say about them. And hopefully, you know, um, if you like the authors that that agent represents, um, you've probably got an agent who, who is going to be right for your writing if, if there's a similarity there. <laughs> fundamental role is to be your representative um, in the industry and to represent you in the best way we possibly can be that you know financially advice reputation our job is to be the person pushing you to the forefront um, putting you in the right place and looking after your interests um, hopefully over a long um, career. Um, it's a relationship that is going to be your most consistent one in publishing, ideally. Um, publishers move jobs a lot more frequently. Publishers can't take their authors with them when they move publishing houses, but your agent will be your agent wherever they are for the long haul. So you're kind of with them as long as you want to be. Um, so for that reason, they will be the person that, you know, you might have deals of a number of publishing houses all at once or over a career, but your agent will be the one person you can go back to and who will be your person to bounce any idea off. The first thing I, I would do when I've taken an author on is to work on the manuscript with them or the proposal with them. Um, there's always like, you know, normally at least one draft that needs to be done with them. Um, but I'm not an editor. I do. I, I, we all agents will do editorial work, but we also hold our hands up that an editor is the expert here, and that they may well want to do two or three more drafts of you once they've bought the book. Um, so then I will identify um, a, a number of editors normally that I would like to pitch this book to. Um, we spend our kind of most of our days meeting and, and, and chatting with editors um, and finding out what they're looking for, building relationships with them. And so you kind of get to know over the years which editors' tastes align with your tastes, who would be the perfect person to send certain books to. So again, that's just kind of a skill that is just honed over years of chats and conversations. Um, and at that point, I will sometimes I'll start speaking to to editors just in a kind of, you know, I see them, I see them at a party and I'll start talking to them about something I'm excited about. Other times it's a little bit more formal where I'll just, you know, spend a morning calling a dozen editors and pitching the book over the phone to them. Um, the next stage is then we kind of, we run either the submission process, which is often 
one of the hardest parts of the authors because it's a long quiet waiting game a lot of the time because it takes people time to read they get an awful lot of other things submitted to them they have to find the time when they're not editing and working on their existing authors to sit down and try and find new authors um, most publishers will have a weekly or fortnightly meeting with their editorial team so if they really like a book and they think it's got potential they'll take it firstly to an editorial meeting where they will hopefully get support of their immediate team and then if they get the support of their immediate team they then will take it to an acquisitions meet meeting which can be like another week or two later um, and then at the acquisitions meeting is when you have marketing publicity finance rights everyone else in the room uh, and they all have to uh, they will already all book by this point and they will have an informed decision. So they will, you know, the salesperson might say, Waterstones are going to love this or Waterstones are going to hate this. Um, and then once you pass that kind of hurdle, hopefully your editor will then be allowed to make an offer to me. They'll come to me with the offer. Um, at that point, I will round up to see if anyone else is going to offer. Um, there are kind of various types of processes there again. So there's there's the auction process. It might be that uh, people want to meet you, that I sometimes take authors around to meet like, you know, half a dozen publishers in a day so they can get a feel of what each publisher is like and what they're offering them. It might be that someone likes it so much and just really wants it that they do something that we call preempt which is a, a, an offer for their kind of highest offer to take it off the table that day. And they normally give you um, a window between about 12 and 24 hours in which to make a decision whether you're going to accept that offer or go to an auction. And you will sort of have to, as an agent, make a call as to whether you think you can get a higher offer at auction. So all these things are kind of little daily kind of decisions we're having to make on your behalf. Um, you know, a good agent will share all this with you and talk you through it and hold your hand through it. And whatever decision of whichever publisher you choose to go with will hopefully be a really informed one. And your agent will give you all of the intel that they know about that publisher, what they do really well, what they maybe could improve upon. Um, once you've decided which publisher you're going with, um, the agent will then do the kind of nitty gritty of the paperwork, the contract. Um, we will decide if we hold on to your international rights or if we sell them to the publisher, which I'll talk to you about a bit in part two. Um, we, um, we kind of set you up on our website and our systems and get very excited about having you on our list. Um, at that point, I will hand the author over to um, the editor to start talking about the actual edits of the book and how they might shape it. Um, different editors and different authors like to work in different ways. That might be that they meet up every now and again and in a pre-COVID world and talk through the manuscript page by page. It might be that they just send some notes. Um, again, authors have different ways of working. Some like to go off and just do everything. Some might want to submit chapter by chapter and get feedback on each one. Everyone has a very different way of working, but there will be usually a delivery deadline in your contract that means that you will be working towards that delivery date. Um, in that time, the agent doesn't, you know, a good agent doesn't just disappear from your life and let you get on with it. They will still be having conversations about your book, either internationally or for TV and film rights, or they will be taking you intermittently into the publisher's office and talking about, um, as it gets closer to publication, talking about um, publicity plans and marketing plans and how we can all kind of band all of our contacts and ideas together to make it the best possible book launch. Um, we will, um, you know, just hold them account for everything. So it just means that you can focus on the creative side, the the exciting side and we can be there in the background saying to the publisher where's this where's this where's the cover how many of you got ordered you know and every step of the way like something like a global pandemic happening 
we're the person that the publisher comes to first and goes, ah, we're going to have to move the publication date. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to do that. And the, and the agent is kind of a sort of go between as well. So we're also helping the publishers make that relationship more smooth. So they don't have to be, you know, we can like help temper bad news. We can help pass on great news, which is the more fun part. Um, and we can also come up with ideas and strategies when things don't seem to be going so well. Um, and then, yeah, so then, then the book comes out. Um, we're still, again, involved. You know, most agents are kind of active on social media, promoting their authors. We meet people out and about, like, you know, festival organisers and things like that. And we'll always be just extolling how great your book is. And um, when you're ready to write the next book, which, you know, might not be for a while, but it might be very quickly, We'll help you with that and coming up with ideas for that um, and just generally shaping your career as it goes along. Um, so there's no kind of one thing, you know, one way that an agent works. Every agent works differently. I've worked at huge, big global agencies with thousands of employees and millions of assistants and different departments in different parts of the world. And I've worked in a two person agency and they they all work in very different ways and it's about what works for you as an author um i personally have found that um you know i don't have an assistant i work at a small agency which allows me to be really hands-on with my authors it allow it means when you call me you get me and not my assistant and I can be a bit more flexible in the kind of deals I do and do interesting things across different platforms and different media. And, you know, there's nobody that is going to kind of have a problem with that. Um, but what it does mean is that I also have an awful lot going on and it's very hard to sometimes, you know, take on new authors and spend time developing new authors when I'm so hands on with my existing authors to make sure that everyone gets my equal attention. kind of common and uh, accessible way is through um, each agency should have submission guidelines on their website um, they will tell you kind of what what their process is uh, in general if it's uh, fiction we normally want the whole book to be ready it, we will ask you probably for the first 50 pages or three chapters but what what it can be really disheartening is if you love the first 50 pages and you go back to them and then they say, oh no, I haven't written any more. And then you wait three, four years for them to come back with the rest. Um, for nonfiction, we can sell books on proposal. So it can just be a proposal. And again, each agency will have different um, instructions on how they like that to be. But generally 50 pages is enough for us to gauge whether we're really interested in it or not. Um, so the other, there is also kind of various different handbooks, like the Writers and Artists Yearbook is the most common one, which has up-to-date information about every UK agency, I think American ones as well, and what they do and who they are and how to contact them. Um, on our agency, um, we all have our own profile bio, so you can just see which one of us is right for you. Um, most agents will expect you to only send to one agent at that agency. Um, so I would identify one person at each agency. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, you might get approached by agents directly. You might even get approached by publishers directly. I always recommend, and I know I would say this, but if a publisher approaches you with an offer, that you ask them to put you in touch with an agent um, because it is for all those reasons I outlined really good to have an agent fight in your corner and you know sometimes what the publisher wants and what is best for the author don't always exactly line up so it's always worth getting an agent to fight your corner and they will always improve your deal and your contract more than they will cost you in commission and agents don't get paid any commission until they've done that work for you. Don't submit to an agent. Um, I mean, 
they're quite basic my don'ts they are things like make sure you get the agent's name right uh, you would be amazed how often this happens that people get my name wrong or I get dear sirs or I get dear mrs johnson or you know or that or dear agent anything that you shows that you've you've looked up that agent you've looked into what they represent you have a reason why you're contacting them specifically um all goes a really long way so um most agents get so many submissions that if you do something basic like get their name wrong or send it to like a thousand agents on the same email all cc'd they will immediately delete your email so really basic but research the agent you're looking at um maybe mention books of theirs that that you enjoyed and that's the reason why you are approaching them um follow their guidelines as much as you can obviously if we say 50 pages and 50 pages cuts you off mid chapter and it's 55 then that's fine um what else can i tell you um one thing that I always think is um, something that's kind of a bit unsaid is that when I was an assistant, I had a lot more time on my hands to read and I was really hungry to build my list. And sometimes approaching, you might see a, a big name agent who looks after, you know, huge name authors and think I want to be with them. But actually, you might have a better, better experience contacting their assistant. You might be read, you might get that really hands on attention and um the assistants are the agents of tomorrow and so there's no reason to be snobby that they're inexperienced and they will have agents around them that can help them with the bits of the industry that they're less experienced of and every every assistant has to start somewhere and build in their list so um really look at who are assistance agencies as well because i think there's some really brilliant ones out there um, and they're doing some really interesting stuff. So that would be my top tip. I get um, maybe 20 a day. So um, obviously that is quite a lot. Um, it has actually increased during lockdown as well because obviously people were furloughed and they've got more time on their hands and there's an awful lot of um, virus thrillers and things going around. Um, but um, if something catches our eye, um, we will, you know, pay attention. And so um, if something seems right for us and they've, they've, they've nailed it with their pitch, then it doesn't mean that it will just go into a blank hole. But um, I can sometimes spend a whole day um, literally just kind of sifting through my submissions. I do try and take at least one afternoon a week where I go through them all, but we can get very, very behind, especially like I say, I don't have an assistant. So um, the bigger agencies that do have assistants have a sort of filter um, sometimes. Um, obviously you're relying on that assistant to have good taste but um, they normally are the kind of filter before it gets to the agent. Also, I think as you become um, a more experienced agent, you often get other ways of people sending them to you. So I get, sometimes I get publishers say they found an author and they want to recommend me as the agent. Sometimes I get um, other authors of mine who, who have author friends and they get recommended to me through, through my existing authors um so it's not even the only way and sometimes we directly approach people where we've we've seen something that they may have written and really want to develop it with them so um yes it there is a lot out there but there's also a lot of agents out there and so there is you know room and like i said there are lots of young hungry agents building lists there's probably now more than ever lots of smaller agencies and one man agencies or one woman agencies where people are leaving the bigger agencies because they want a more flexible way of working. And so I would say there's probably more actual agencies than ever. Um, so 
yeah, it's not, it, it may appear that way, but it's not a closed industry. We always want great writing. We always want great, great authors to work with. So it's not, you know, there, there, there is no gatekeeper. It's just time and time management for us. I don't know how often I do it. Um, I've never really kind of looked if it's uh, probably do it more like I say more now than maybe when I started out where I probably was starting more with the slush pile there's all sorts of different ways of doing it you might you might go to a creative writing event um, you might go to um, um, or any sort of event and, and see someone that you like um, or you might read an interview with somebody in a, in a in a newspaper or a magazine and think there's a book in that. Um, there are certain, you know, dream people. Like I, I have a particular love of music um, and there are certain sort of, you know, dream musicians that I would love to write a book and, you know, that can take a while to get to them, but that normally has to be me going to them rather than the other way around. Um, you, know, um, you know, with journalists, you know, they might write an article that you, you like and you think can can work um you know watch a tv program i love and approach somebody in the tv program it might be as basic as you know you know i've seen um an anonymous blog and that's really intrigued me um or an instagram account that's really intrigued me um so um i don't know how with what regularity but um you know i wouldn't sit around waiting for an agent to approach you um but um we're definitely pro you know, i'm proactive anyway i don't know about every agent out there but i and i feel like especially peers my age and younger um are pretty proactive in going out there and seeing what the conversations are being had and wanting to broaden the landscape of publishing um with new voices so you know sometimes people who don't think publishing is an industry for them or haven't thought about writing a book just needs that encouragement and that confidence um and editors do it too editors, i know lots of editors who go out there and approach um people they see saying funny things online and so on and 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 just talking to them about whether they've even thought about doing a book so you know i have a quite a few poets on my list and selling straight up poetry is pretty tricky so normally if i take on a poet it's because they've got other ideas of books they want to do in, in fiction and non-fiction, so. Again, like I never calculate it by kind of year and month. Um, my list is pretty balanced with fiction and non-fiction. Um, my, my fiction tends to, you know, novels, take longer to write they take longer to sell because they take longer to read so you know if a, if a non-fiction idea is good it's a good concept you can normally put a proposal together and get an idea if a publisher is going to buy it in a pretty speedy time so that's almost like the bread and butter sometimes um it's never quite as exciting as having a novel that you probably spent you know at least a year with the author working it up and getting it into shape and then other people love it just as much as you and it gets nominated for prizes and all sorts and it can really go big and turn into films and tv programs and so there's something really special about the novel um debuts are actually in a way you've probably heard this if you if you kind of tune into any kind of stories in the book world are an easier pitch than kind of an author on their third or fourth book sometimes because there's no sales history there's no like previous you know mediocre sales history that would put a publisher off they can start again and just launch somebody out in the into the world and i'm sure you've also heard that sometimes some very big authors debuts were actually their third or fourth book and they changed their name and they hadn't solved their their original ideas and they decided to rebrand so that they could sell their book as a debut. Um, so how many a year? I mean, it depends on the year. Um, maybe between two and five. I know it doesn't sound like much, but if you've got existing authors um, 
you're working with already that's actually quite a lot of time to give over to developing new writers but different agents do different things some agents just do fiction some agents just do non-fiction um i like to do a bit of most things there's certain things i don't do which is kind of sci-fi fantasy super genre crime and thriller type stuff but if my existing authors are like oh i want to try my hand at, at writing a thriller then i would of course encourage them and, and help them but i don't kind of go out looking for things like sci-fi and adventure that i don't really have an expertise in whether something's good or not and i don't have the same kind of editorial contacts that would be my colleague ed if you're writing sci-fi or fantasy um so um yeah you, know, you might find if you approach an agent who just who just does uh, fiction that you've got a better chance of them having time to take you on really useful um obviously sometimes people can be a bit grandiose and be like this is just like james joyce's ulysses or <laughs> but um you know especially kind of current in the last five ten years books that you might compare it to it's really useful shorthand for an agent to know if it's their kind of thing um and especially you know you don't have to be on you know following anyone's um footsteps but you can you know definitely helping people immediately be able to situate it in the market is really helpful it could be, it doesn't have to be a book either it can be a film or a tv program that has a similar kind of feel to your book this is a really um this is a part that doesn't often get discussed immediately sometimes when people are looking for an agent they just want to have like a you know their book out in the uk and that's enough for them but there can be um occasions where a book success can be built around it, its kind of international um buzz as well so you might if you anybody reads the book seller and sees the deal sometimes they'll say it's sold in 13 territories already and it's not even you know in five minutes i mean they're normally exaggerations but so yeah rights is a really um interesting part a lot of agencies will have their own rights person or rights team some of the smaller ones use just use co-agents which are um agents sort of in every territory who we work alongside who know their territory and will but they they're often working for a number of different agencies and publishers so you're sometimes battling a little bit more for their attention so if you have an in-house rights person at the agency that means that your book will get that specific attention um and and passion um my my rights colleague helen will if i'm really excited about something and i think it's got international prospects then i will share it with her sometimes before i've even taken on the author and we, she will sometimes kind of join me to pitch to the author about why they should come to me as an agent and what she can do for it internationally um some books obviously will not work internationally you know especially non-fiction is a lot harder because it tends to be about uh either kind of what's going on in British society at the moment or that a different country might have their own version of that person. So if it's somebody writing, a, you know, like a memoir about their, a really beautiful memoir about their alcoholism, you know, the, a French publisher will say, oh, we have our own alcoholics here and they can do their own book. It can be that brutal. <laughs> but um, so I guess in translation, things are a bit more plot based. It's less kind of on the kind of nuances of the writing. It might be a bit more about the plot. Um, but you can sometimes, we can sometimes have deals in a number of territories before it's even got a UK deal away and that can help us get the UK deal away. Um, I like to work, um, I go to New York every year and I, I like to work across American publishing as well. Um, and, you know, several of my books in the last couple of years have actually been bigger in America than they've been here and that all leads to like the buzz around them. Um, and so it's a really you know and, and on a basic level it's extra income for the author so you might sell the original book for a very modest advance in the uk but if you hold on to the rights you can do that that advance like 10 times over in 10 different territories and it's constant kind of income and it's you know most authors just love to be read 
internationally in different languages. Again, there's no kind of set thing, it depends on the book, but um, you know, normally your first advance at least will not be enough to kind of retire on unless you're very lucky, but um, you will get an advance from the publisher which will be paid normally in thirds or quarters, which is um, a part on the signature of the contract to help you get away with writing the book, a part when you deliver it and it's accepted by the publishers so that they can reward you for having done it, um, a part on publication and sometimes a part on paperback publication as well. Um, and then that at the moment, that's one of the things that maybe has been quite affected by COVID is that publishers are wanting to pay less up front and more down the line. Um, and that's something that your agent, that's why it's really great to have an agent because your agent will go, no. Or they'll go, we're not publishing it for another year now, so we're not going to pay the publication advance. And your agent will go, no. So these are all reasons why an agent's really good to have on hand for when things like that happen and there's no, no, no one's there to kind of foresee it. Um, and then internationally, um, advances are, are normally kind of a little bit more around the four figure range, unless you've written like a kind of super, you know, something that's really prime for that market, um, that they, they're really hungry for and there's a big auction, but normally, um, international advances are around the four figure mark. Um, but American advances, America is a much bigger country. They print in much larger numbers. So your US advance should normally be bigger than your UK advance. Um, so that's simply because they just print more. They're a bigger country. Um, so, um, you know, a book that I might sell for say 10,000 pounds in the UK, I might sell for 100,000 pounds in the US. That's not like an every situation, but that's, you know, might, might be quite a good marker. Um, and then the other thing, which is something that I'm, I'm particularly passionate about, and that I've actually had quite a lot of, um, there's quite a lot of energy there at the moment, is the film and TV industry. And um, they're really hungry for books to adapt. Um, it's obviously a very complicated process with developers and funding and a number of people on board and different scripts written by different people. But so, you know, probably 80% of TV and film deals don't happen. But the ones that but you still get money while they're trying to make them happen. And the ones that do happen will just have amazing effects on your book sales. Um, you'll get money for the actual TV. And um, it's a really, um, I think, really dynamic part of the industry that can give a whole new life to the book, as I'm sure you, anyone that watched Normal People would have seen, you know, just how that has really, you know, that book was already a great seller, but it's just gone to a whole new level from, from the TV series. Um, so yeah, it doesn't kind of stop once we, like, you know, I can't speak for all agents, but for me, it doesn't stop as soon as I've sold you to your UK publisher. I will be going to New York and talking to you, talking about you in New York. I will be going to, me and my colleagues will be going to the international book fairs in Frankfurt and London if they ever come back and talking about you there. My the rights people will be, you know, my, my colleague Helen in COVID has set up a, a podcast where she talks about one of our books on our list and pitches it and sends it to all the international editors and does it that way, which I think is really amazing and inventive way to do it because she can't go out there and see them. Um, so we're, we're, it's a, you know, it's a really, it, it, it's a constant thing that's always happening that like we, you know, some agents do, you know, I'm sure they do just like do the deal, they get their commission and then they walk away and wait for the author to write their next book. Um, but that's not how I work and I don't, wouldn't find that personally satisfying. Um, I like to be involved as much as I can be. The other, the other option, if I, if we didn't, hold on to the rights and we didn't sell them as an agency is we would use them as part of the negotiation with the publisher um, publishers have their own rights teams um, again they, they've probably got more books that they're selling rights for so they not, aren't necessarily um, be able to dedicate as much time to each book but they will maybe increase your UK offer to a much larger amount to incorporate your international rights. So then they will go off and sell them. And again, that can be really useful too. Like I have, um, I had a debut novel with Penguin last year 
they they had the rights and they sold it to um, a sister penguin company in America um, who paid a separate advance and everything, but it gave them that kind of immediate access to the American side of Penguin and they got a, a really great deal for the author. And sometimes if you can't get a deal internationally, what they can then do is they can distribute it in those territories for you. So, um, yeah, and then once, going back to the model, once once your book is hopefully earning an, enough, so if, if, if a publisher bought your book for say 20,000 pounds and then they did um, 20,000 pounds worth of rights deals on it before it even come out, you would be seeing profit straight away. So you'd be seeing, you know, money on every copy you sold. So that's one of the reasons why um, that money would go against earning out your advance if you sold it to the publisher, but if your agent kept it, they'd just be separate little bits of income that kept coming in. So both models will ultimately earn you money. Um, there's just you know people have different preferences and it depends on the publisher and how good their rights team are and all those sort of factors um once you have earned out your advance hopefully you will be seeing um royalties and they are accounted to you every six months so um for most publishers some are annual but most is every six months and um we as your agents will check over those royalty statements make sure they tally with what we believe they should be and um pay those out to you so that's a nice little top up that comes in constantly um other uh, other rights that publishers tend to hold on to are things like um radio rights so like book of the week you would get an extra little lump sum for some if your book made book of the week um serialization in magazines and newspapers uh, or things that the publishers tend to handle um so those are all just kind of little incremental ways that your book can start to earn out its advance um the thing about advances is you never have to pay them back so you might not sell a single copy but as long as you've delivered the book um and you won't ever have to pay that advance back um and there is sometimes an argument that it's not always best to take a really humongous advance that you've got no chance of ever earning out because when it comes to sell your next book after your humongous advance, your debut, the publisher will go, well, we're still trying to earn back like £200,000 on the last book, so we can't invest in a new book. Um, so there is sometimes an argument for taking a realistic advance that has a chance of earning out, making you see royalties, and then you're a more viable option for your next book and books down the line. I am engaged on social media a bit. I've sort of, um, you know, I think it can be a little bit of a, an echo chamber. So I try not to kind of use that too much as a gauge of what's going on in the world. But, um, you know, you kind of know what the hit TV show is and you kind of know what the hit book is just kind of through osmosis quite a lot of the time. Um, I wish I had time to read every kind of hot book out there that isn't one of mine, but I don't. <laughs> but, um, you know, I will try and read kind of, or dip into the kind of hot books to know what, what people are talking about. But I tend to try and not follow trends. Like if a book's good, a book's good. And if I love the voice and the characters, then it doesn't matter what the genre is and what the market is saying. There are certain parts of the market where it's much more specific. So for example, I do do a little bit in the kind of lifestyle cookery kind of area. And, you know, there was a time where um, everyone wanted a vegan book. And then there was a time where everyone had their vegan books. They didn't want any more vegan books. And so we have something like, and, and the kids market is a bit similar and there are certain trends like, you know, this week it's vampires next week it's romance next week it's like queer stories you know it can be a little bit more if you're before the trend you're too early and they, they don't want to take a risk um if you're a little bit too late they've already got their author doing that on their list so you've got to try and hit that moment where people are ready to try something new and they see a movement but um they haven't yet bought every book in that field already so yeah I mean I try not to to follow it 
in a sort of religious way and go out actively looking for like oh i really want some like um you know um uplit which was like a buzzword that was going around last year i would never kind of approach stuff that way i do personally feel like there's a dearth of kind of romantic comedies um with sort of fresh ideas and i do feel that um there's a space outside of the horrible kind of chick lit kind of tag for really smart stories about women's relationships with friends and partners that i haven't seen loads of um but you know there was yes yeah, so there are certain things i have a wish to see um more of but i don't um i think you know people and editors that i work with and uh who are doing interesting successful stuff i don't think they're going out there looking sort of cynically for like who's the next sally rooney um or anything like that i think you know if a really talented young irish writer came across my path i'd be excited if their book was good not because i could sell it as the new sally rooney and that could be a detriment to them as well so um that doesn't really answer your question i think <laughs> um personally for me if the writing is great and this and i and i love it then it wouldn't matter if it fell into a trend or or anything um and you know like i say it, there's something a bit kind of disconcerting about there being a trend for like black voices or queer voices because trends can disappear and it shouldn't be trendy it should just be part of the canon um for me um and so I'm glad that those voices are getting elevated and that those writers are getting paid on par with other writers. I think that um, there's something a bit distasteful about being like, oh yeah, you know, writers of colour are suddenly actually selling books so now we can just take them on. Um, that wouldn't be why I would approach someone. <laughs>
and you know that therefore you probably will fit into my list on what I'm looking for um a little blurb about the book is obviously helpful um you don't have to kind of give it all away um I often say that the kind of the kind of blurbs that you see on a book cover is quite a good comparison so I don't need to know that like at the end like the brother gets stabbed because I'm, I'm just like oh but you know a, a little bit of like this is about these characters it's set here um a, a big event happens that that you know causes them all to reevaluate. dot 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 that can be enough um and then obviously a bit about you um you know anything that you have um achieved that might be relative to your book um it can just be a little you know if if you haven't done a creative writing course or you haven't been shortlisted for a prize it can just be like you know my name's jim and i live in south end and i like walking with my dog and that can be just equally as you know insightful it doesn't have to be a whole list of your achievements forever um and like we said before a comparison or two is often really helpful just to kind of give us a kind of shortcut to know what we're looking at here um yeah and obviously if you've been if you've been published before um put that in um and with non-fiction it's slightly different i guess because normally you're trying to identify something that's um maybe not been done um and um you know it might be a slightly different approach because you're talking about an idea or a concept i think it depends sometimes i don't because i don't want the spoiler and i think it might kind of sort of distract me from being able to gauge the pace of a book if it is the kind of book that has like you know a big reveal or anything like that then it might be um it might be slightly spoilery so normally i probably read the fifth what i might do is read the 50 pages then look at the synopsis and then ask them to send me the rest if i was still excited about where they might take it but i think every agent is different i'm actually reading a bit right now that i was sent on the slush pile that i'm quite excited about but i haven't got to the point of offering them representation yet um I, there's, and there's some I've missed out on, like I really, uh, there was a book that came out um, this spring called um, Exciting Times by an author called Nisha Dolan and I read that on, on the slush pile and I desperately wanted to be her agent but I lost out. So um, yeah, that's everything, you know, you could spend loads of time investing in an author and still not get to represent them. So it, again, that kind of adds to all the amount of work we have going on. Um, I, who else have I taken on? I mean, I've got um, quite a lot of my authors are kind of onto their kind of second and third books at, at this point. So one thing that's been quite easy to get away in um, lockdown is kind of books with authors who have existing editors. So you don't have to do a wider submission. So um, I have an author called Lara Williams, whose debut novel came out um, last spring and her paperback comes out next week and that book's called Supper Club and I think that's a really brilliant book and kind of probably a really good marker of the kind of books that I really like to work on. Distinct and experience mixed together, I think. Um, I mean, you can normally tell if if something, you know, something grips you or you're intrigued to turn the page, that's just a natural instinct and you just hope that other people feel the same way. Um, or if a voice really captures you and you respond to it, it's a really like gut instinct and it's, it's very hard to kind of quantify that. Um, yeah, I mean, like the majority of stuff we get is probably okay and it's neither spectacular or terrible. And so that's the hard part because you think there is like the nub of something really good in this, but am I the right person to kind of take it to spectacular? Um, or are they the right writers to be able to take it to spectacular? So the majority of stuff is just pretty decent, but maybe not P 
people will park their money decent. So it's that's probably the hardest thing about it um, is that you know it's very rare that you see something that's terrible, um, and it's whether you keep going and 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 you're excited about the nub of an idea. Um, stuff that's just kind of brilliant on a sentence by sentence level, I guess it's just an instinctive thing. Um, and you know, I, I did an English degree, I've been in publishing for 15 years, so I kind of have read a lot <laughs> at this point, and I know what what is the kind of thing that I enjoy reading. And uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can tell pretty quickly if something's great.